I encourage you all as well to grab your Bible or to make use of that pew Bible there in front of you. We're going to continue our conversation this morning in Philippians chapter 4. And for our first graders, you're going to turn with me to page 1,306. 1,306. Philippians chapter 4, continuing together in verse 4. We're going to have a conversation as a church this morning around this passage of Scripture, really talking specifically about peace, what it means to live in peace, and what it means to have a relationship with a God who is described as the God of peace. Our United Nations that we know continues to influence uh, many countries and many things the world over currently steward 600 peace treaties. The United Nations has sought to collaboratively work with many nations around the world in an effort to steward peace. But unfortunately, and I am certain as frustrating as it must be for those who are involved in these negotiations, we know that almost before the ink dries on some of these peace treaties, it seems to be that one party has been in violation. Although we greatly as a nation and as individuals desire peace, peace seems to be elusive. Peace seems to be a challenge to maintain, even though at our core, we would all agree that we desire peace. Avoiding any sort of cliches, we all know that we desire world peace. We desire peace in our communities. We desire peace in our homes. We desire peace in our hearts and peace in our minds. This morning, as we consider this passage of Scripture together in Philippians chapter 4, it, the conversation revolves around understanding what it means to live in peace. You'll notice in our text in verse 7 of chapter 4, it says unto us that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 9, somewhat as a benediction, it says to us, and the God of peace will be with you. Traditionally, whenever this passage of Scripture is considered, it is often taken from the point of view as a list of commands. As you will see here in a moment when we read the entirety of the passage, you will notice that there are five commands given in this passage of Scripture. So typically when we study Philippians chapter 4 together, what we do is we come up with a list and we say, these are the things that God wants you to do and these are the things that God asks us not to do. But my intent for our time together this morning is to not give you a list. But rather, my intent with you this morning is to take this passage of Scripture and help all of us grow in a deeper and stronger understanding of who God is. And I believe that as we fall more in love with God the Father, as we grow deeper in our relationship with the God of peace, the behavior that He desires will follow the relationship. Just like we see in our marital, marital relationships of those of you who are husbands and wives, you do for your husband or you do for your wife, not because of authority, not because of command, but you do for your husband or wife because you love them, you care for them. The behavior follows the relationship. I hope for you and I that as we learn more about God this morning, that these behaviors that are no doubt commanded will flow freely in our lives. Consider this passage, Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. God's word says to us, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God 
which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Verse 9 serves as a benediction, if you will, to our passage of scripture in which it says, and the God of peace will be with you. This benediction is a common refrain that we hear other places in Scripture. This benediction finds itself in 2 Thessalonians as well as in Romans. But more importantly than this refrain serving as a benediction, this refrain serves better yet as a description of God. This benediction gives us a glimpse, it gives us a better insight into understanding who God the Father is. Verse 9 describes God in this way, and it says that He is a God of peace. We know that in the beginning of the world, when God went about His creation, He was a God who only created peace. Everything that he created was brought about in an orderly and in a peaceful manner. In the beginning, we see that everything that God created lived in peace. Adam and Eve lived in peace with one another. Adam and Eve lived in peace with creation. Adam and Eve lived in peace with God. All that God had made was at peace. God himself is the source of peace. The only way in which we are ever going to experience and sustain peace in our lives is to have a relationship with the God of peace. The reason that our world continues to struggle, the reason that peace is so elusive among the nations, the reason that we struggle to find and maintain peace is because much of our world remains outside of a relationship with the God of peace. Therefore, one of the most influential, one of the most important things that we can do in our lives as we desire to strengthen our relationships with one another, as we desire to change our nation, as we desire to influence our communities and change the world, one of the most influential things that we can do is introduce people to the God of peace. Because outside of a relationship with this God, there will be no peace. Sin has so broken our world. Sin has so impacted our lives in a great way that it has even brought about the lack of peace in our very relationships with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says unto us, By faith we have peace with God the Father. By faith, we have peace with God the Father. We were once enemies with God, but through the work of God in Jesus Christ, He has brought about peace. God has been busy about restoring the world and bringing it back under his reign and back under a peaceful relationship with him. One of my favorite stories about the restoration of God in peace can be seen in Jesus' lifetime in Matthew's gospel in chapter 8. I'll just share the story with you briefly for a moment. You may recall in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus and his followers are getting into a boat to cross to the other side. And while they are crossing to the other side, a storm comes upon the lake. The storm is so intense that it says the waves grew so large, they began to crash over the side of the boat. It is said of the disciples and the followers who were in the boat with Jesus that day that they feared for their lives. Meanwhile, Jesus, the Lord, is asleep in the boat. 
The disciples cannot stand it, so they awaken the Lord and they say to him, Lord, do you not care that we are at risk of losing our lives? And Jesus, in his lordship, stands on the boat and says, be still. And immediately that which was not peaceful is restored. Jesus has been about restoring peace physically in his ministry and spiritually in our lives. When Jesus went to the cross to die for the forgiveness of our sins, it was about restoring a peaceful relationship between us and God. Although we were once enemies, we have now become the friends of God through the peace that has been brought about through Jesus Christ. The only way you're ever going to experience peace peace in your life is through a restored relationship with God Almighty. It says to us in our text in Philippians chapter 4, if you look in verse 7, he writes unto us, he says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and will guard your minds in Christ Jesus. Let me just ask everyone who's here for a moment by show of hands, how many of you would like the peace of God to dwell in your hearts? How many of you would like the peace of God to dwell in your life, to guard your heart and to guard your mind in Christ Jesus? Then the only way you're going to experience that peace is by having a restored relationship with the God of peace. Let's talk for a moment about what the peace of God is like. He describes it to us in Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. And it's important for us to understand that the peace of God is not like the peace that we so often speak of in this world. The peace of God is a divine peace. It's a transcendent peace that goes beyond our circumstances in this life. Jesus taught us about this peace. And I want to invite you in your Bible to turn with me to John chapter 14. For our first graders, I want to invite you to turn back with me to the left to page 1186. For the rest of us, we are in John chapter 14, considering together verse 27, in which we understand in this moment that Jesus is preparing us and his disciples for his departure. But it's in this moment in John 14 that Jesus helps us understand the peace of God. Listen to Jesus' words. Jesus said unto us, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. How many of us as believers in Christ understand that the peace of God is our inheritance from Christ? That which God desires for us. He says so clearly in verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. We are guarantees. We are given the inheritance of a divine peace of God through Jesus Christ. And it is a peace that is not of this world. Notice that Jesus says, I do not give to you as the world gives. Think with me for a moment about this. Perhaps you find yourself a little bit overstressed. Perhaps you find yourself a little weary, a little anxious, and a little tired. And so you reach out to someone, perhaps a close friend or perhaps even a doctor, and you begin to share your woes about the lack of peace that you have in your life. In all likelihood, the advice that you're going to get from the world, they're going to simply say, you know what, why don't you take a break? You're overworked. You need to remove yourself from the situation and go on a vacation. Spend some time away from all of the things that are stressing you out and robbing you of your peace. But I want to show you something here in God's Word. That's not the kind of peace that Jesus is offering us. 
Go on in John chapter 14 and look what Jesus says in verse 28. He says, you heard me say I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad and I am going to the Father for the Father is greater than I am. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. Understand what Jesus is doing here. He is instructing the disciples for the moment that he leaves, that he goes to be with God the Father. He is preparing their hearts and he's preparing their minds. But he says very boldly to them, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Do not be afraid. And what makes this peace different from the peace that exists in the world is that God does not remove them from their circumstances. But rather what God does is he commits to being with them in their circumstances. So many times the way we try to achieve peace is by changing that's what's around us, by changing our circumstances, by changing the people. And in some ways that has effect, but at best it's momentary, it's not lasting. But the peace that God offers us is a peace that comes from Him. Is it a divine peace that is transcendent of this world? Is it a peace that does not take us out of our circumstances, but it is a peace that helps us endure. Jesus doesn't change the plan of salvation. He doesn't say to the disciples, oh, I know you wish that I did not have to leave, but it is better for you that I go. And so many times the way that God responds and works in our lives is not by changing our circumstances, but the way that God brings peace is far better. He draws near to us. There are men and women seated in this room sharing pews with you right now who can testify to the peace of God amongst challenging circumstances. There are men and women seated in these very pews right here who've been given a a diagnosis of cancer, some for the first time, some for the second and third time. And yet somehow as they continue to walk through a very challenging trial, a very harrowing disease, as they continue to struggle and labor, they are able to say, I am at Nothing about their circumstances has changed, but they have drawn so near to God that God has given them a peace. There are men and women seated in the pews with you here this morning who recently, just in the last week and previously, have lost a loved one. They've suffered a significant loss, and yet even in spite of those challenging circumstances, they are able to utter the refrain, it is well with my So, the peace that God offers you and I is not a freedom from challenging circumstances and trials in life, but the peace that God offers us, the peace that we inherit through Christ Jesus is a peace to draw near to God and that He will walk with us through the trial. He will walk with us through the challenge. This is the peace that God desires for you to have. It's a peace that's not contingent upon your circumstances, and it's a peace that is not even contingent upon His response to your prayers in verse 6 of Philippians chapter 4. It is a peace of God. I would turn your attention back to Philippians chapter 4. And I want to invite you to begin to look with me at this list of commands. As we move through verse 4 all the way to verse 9, you will notice that there are five imperative commands. There are five commands given unto you and I as believers, things that we should do and we should follow. But what I want you to notice about these five things is that these are five things that will either restore our peace are these are things that will either pull us away from peace. Go back to Philippians chapter 4, and for our first graders that are using their Bible, that's page 1306. 
And in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, listen to these commands that will either restore our peace or that will pull us away from peace. He says, beginning in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Not once, but twice. In the same breath, the Apostle Paul calls us to rejoice. Now, you will notice if you do a survey of the entire book of Philippians that this is not the first or the second time we have been given the command to rejoice, but this is in fact the fourth time the Apostle Paul has said unto us, we are to rejoice. God has given you and I the opportunity to be able to rejoice in all circumstances, Regardless of whatever trial we are facing, regardless of whatever sits in front of us, there is an opportunity to rejoice in the Lord, to give thanks to God, not only for his provision, but to give thanks to God for who he is. Sometimes one of the most powerful things in my life as a follower of Christ can be the discipline of rejoicing, can be the discipline of worship. If I wake up in the morning and I happen to wake up on the wrong side of the bed, which even happens to me as a preacher, if I happen to have one of those blue Mondays or life just begins to creep in on me, one of the most effective things I have found in my life is to spend time rejoicing, spend time worshiping God. And when I lift my eyes up to God and I begin to praise and worship and take joy in God the Father, it has a way of restoring peace. It has a way of refocusing my heart and my mind and allowing me to inherit the peace of God. We are commanded to rejoice Not once, not twice, not three times, but four times we are given the command to rejoice. He goes on to us, continue to talk to us about peace. He says, let your gentleness be evident unto all. That is, let your gentleness, how you respond, how you interact, be evident unto all. All the wisdom of the Proverbs in Proverbs chapter 15 verse 1 says unto us that a harsh word stirs up anger, but a soft word spoken has a way of calming wrath. There is counsel in recognizing that how we respond affects the situation. Many of you are aware that April and I have recently moved into a new home. And as a result of that, we have become frequent shoppers at Home Depot. And we have purchased many things through Home Depot online. But one of the key items that we have purchased is we have begun purchasing glass shower doors because none of our bathrooms have shower curtains and doors. And so we are anxious to restore and put glass there so we can shower without towels on the floor. But to our dismay, not one time, but not two times, but three times, we have gotten the joyous text from Home Depot that says your order is ready to pick up only to arrive at the store and the assistants that are there cannot find our order. Now, I have a choice in this moment of how to respond. I can get upset about it, of which certainly no one would probably fault me for that. This is time number three. We're two months into the house and water is on the floor. But I can also choose to be gentle. It's not the person in front of me's fault that my order is not there. They had absolutely nothing to do with it. I can choose to be gentle, and what I can do is I can not only maintain peace in the moment, but I can also restore peace in my own heart. Because if I allow myself to be upset, if I allow myself to head down that path, I am the one expending the energy. And so by being gentle, I keep the peace. 
He goes on to us yet again, giving us another imperative command. But this time, it's not a positive. It's one on a negative. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Hear this. There are two commands in one verse. He first says to us, do not be anxious. The number one thing that is robbing you of the peace of God in your life is anxiousness. Please don't miss this. The number one thing that will pull you out of experiencing the peace of God that the God of peace wants to impart to you is living in anxiousness. And he says to us in verse 6, not a suggestion. He says to us in verse 6, a command, do not be anxious. In Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 6, when he was teaching about worry, he said three times to us in a command voice, do not worry. I love you and I'm going to implore you as a pastor that if you continue to disobey God's word about anxiousness, you will continue to lack the peace of God in your life. The number one thing that is robbing all of us of the peace of God is anxiousness. And notice that he says to us, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We find yet again the next command. Rather than be anxious, that which God wants us to do is to come into our relationship with Him and make it known to Him that which has stirred our heart towards anxiousness. We have an incredible invitation by God to come to him in all situations. Notice that we are not to be anxious about anything, but in every situation, we are to come to God in prayer. One of the key ways that we can calm an anxious heart is by laying it before God the Father. By coming to Him in prayer and bearing our heart and our mind before Him and making it known that which we are anxious about. And as we come into that relationship with God, we are reminded that He is Lord and there is this divine transcendent opportunity in our lives that allows God to give us peace. After all, we are praying, we're talking to the God of the world. We're talking to the God who has all things in his hand. If anyone can help us with that which has made us anxious, it is him. And it is no coincidence, it is of no fault that he goes on to us in verse 8 and continues. And he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Let me encourage you to look at this passage in its entirety. There's a reason he then talks about what we think about. Because typically what happens is we are anxious, we are nervous, we are worried. And so what we do is we go to God in prayer and we share with him that which has made us anxious. And then what we do is we continue to think about it. In fact, we don't only think about it, we continue to imagine the worst possibilities We continue to play through our minds one scenario after another, and we continue to catastrophize the situation. It is no accident that what we are told to do is to think about something else. He says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, think about such things. Do not be anxious. Come to God in prayer and think about other things. Set your mind upon the true things, the noble things, the right things, the pure things, the things of God, and you will receive peace. Friends, what are you thinking about. Just as it takes discipline to lay your prayers before him, it also takes discipline to control what you think about. Now, you may be seated here and you may be saying to me, although not audibly at this point, you may be saying, but brother Robert, you don't understand. I can't stop the thoughts that come in my mind. 
And I would agree with you. And Martin Luther, one of the men who led the Ref- one of the reformations in the church, he said unto us a quote that is very helpful that I want to encourage you with this morning. Martin Luther said to us, he said, you cannot stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop that bird from building a nest on top of your head. And so here's the truth I want you to hear. You cannot stop a thought when it comes into your mind. Those thoughts are going to come up. In fact, Satan himself is going to shoot a flaming arrow into your mind to distract you, to pull you away from God, to make you worry and to make you doubt. You can't stop the thought from coming, but what you can do is choose to not dwell upon it. What you can choose to do is to not allow it to fester. You can't stop it from flying over, but you can stop it from building a nest. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, make your requests known to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is right, think about such things. There are some things that will restore peace And there are some things that will take peace away from our lives. Are you living in the peace of God? There's one thing, last thing I want to show you and then I'm done. Notice with me in Philippians chapter 4, go back to verse 5. And I want to point one thing as we close together. Notice that there is this list of commands to rejoice, to be gentle, to not be anxious. We went through the entire list, but notice amongst this list, there is one statement. He says to us in verse five, the Lord is near. See, what makes this peace so attainable, what makes this peace reasonable within our lives is because the Lord is near is near. This nearness means, I think, two things. It means not only that the Lord is coming. In Philippians chapter 2 earlier, or excuse me, chapter 3 in verse 20, we were told as believers in Christ to eagerly anticipate, to await the return of our Savior. So nearness to God is in part understanding that He is coming again. But nearness to God also means that He is with us and among us. Matthew chapter 18 said unto us that where two or three gather in his name, the Lord is with them. Psalms has written to us that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. The Lord is near. And because the Lord is near, we can be at peace. Several years ago, my family and I took a spring break road trip to White Sands, New Mexico. We left from Central Texas and drove up to New Mexico, and we own a travel trailer. And so my parents came along in their travel trailer, and we caravanned up north to White Sands, New Mexico. Now, those of you who are familiar with the area know that there's a large mountain range and that you have to cross to get down into White Sands. It's absolutely breathtaking as you ascend some 14,000 feet. You're in the trees and in the snows, and then literally as you crest the mountain, you descend down into a desert with this stark contrast between the two. To our dismay, while we were driving up the mountain, as we got within reach of the peak, this great windstorm arose. In fact, all of our radios began to blare this alert, notifying us of sustained winds of 50 to 60 miles per hour. The winds were so strong that literally there were moments where I feared that we would roll the camper over as it like a sail caught gusts of wind. As we safely descended, obviously, (laughs) and I reflected upon that day, the one thing that stood out to me the most was the contrast between the people in the front seats and the people in the back seat. 
I am in the front seat, white knuckling the steering wheel, staring straight ahead, putting my body and knees into holding this car and moving it straight. But my children in the background are laughing and giggling and playing almost as if nothing is happening around us. But they were able to be at peace because they knew that their father was at the wheel. When you make Jesus the Lord of your life, he is the God of peace. And you are able to be at peace because he is Lord. So that no matter what you encounter, he is Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment of worship that we've had to gather together. And we thank you for being a God who can restore our peace. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are here this morning. And I pray that if there is one, Father, who is here today who is overwhelmed, who is anxious, who is weary and who is tired. Father, I pray that as the God of peace, you would bring about a restoration. I pray that they would put their eyes upon you and you would heal them. Father, thank you for who you are and thank you for the way in which you've loved us and cared for us. And thank you for being a God that although the storm may rage, there is peace. We ask all this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.